Let's all come on in and get seated. Well, go ahead and get seated. We've got a long way to go and not much time to get there. And I apologize because I'm, it's obvious I'm not going to cover as much as I wanted to. I've got a whole bundle of stuff here to talk about. And, but uh, I think we need to get to the 23rd Psalm. There are two passages, I think, that describe what a shepherd is. One is the 23rd Psalm, and the other is John chapter 10. I seriously doubt we'll be able in, in today or tomorrow to get to John chapter 10, where Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. There are hirelings who are shepherds. And we're not, we probably won't get time to get over there because it, you know, a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so, when you're developing shepherds, folks, we spend so much time talking about qualifications of elders. And I'm not minimizing a single one of those qualifications. And we feel like when we teach, taught the responsibility, taught the qualifications of elders, we've, we're, we've done what God wants us to do. That's not reality. We give a qualification of an elder. We don't give the qualification of a pastor shepherd. And that's one of the reasons the church suffers with the elderships it has and has suffered. That's not to be negative about the church. I thank God for every man who said, I will be an elder. And uh, I, I know so many of you thought, when I was asked to be an elder, I thought, I don't know how to do this. And it's, you're saying the truth. There's no elder that knows that. But it's the study of passages like the 23rd Psalm that will help us. The Lord is my shepherd. One little boy tried to memorize this and he said, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need. I like that summation of this song. But we don't live in a shepherd society. They grew up in a shepherd society. The moment the Lord says, you're shepherds of the flock, they immediately knew what they were to do. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He gives me green pastures and still waters. I think of still waters and I think of the calmness of when the Lord says, Peace be still. And, and peace within the church begins with an eldership. And then an eldership of the local preacher. And any time there's, there's turmoil between inside an eldership or between the preacher and the elderships, terrible times lie ahead because the church is going to stop functioning. Brother Gus Nichols says, when the church stops, fun uh, stops functioning, you have friction, they have sideways friction. But as long as you've got forward momentum, you'll have less friction. You want the church to be outward and ongoing and alive, then continue to bring new blood into that congregation. New members. And they come in with unbearable, unbelievable problems, but sometimes those problems become a blessing because it gives every member a particular place they can friendship and, and help in relationship to that. Green pastures and still waters. He restores my soul. What does that mean? I want you to think about the time you were the most discouraged you've ever been. Maybe the death of a child. Maybe the death of parents the death of a husband or a wife. 
Maybe it's just some problem. Maybe it's what the doctor said if you, after your life, doctor's visit, visit, and you walk out to the car. How am I going to tell my wife and my kids? How am I going to tell my brothers and sisters? How am I going to tell them what the doctor said? And so sheep have those things in their lives. And they need their soul revived. Revive us again. Revive us again. And the Lord does that. But there have been those times in which as a preacher I have been almost ready to quit and give up. And then there's that individual that comes and says some things to me, maybe not even knowing how much I was hurting. Maybe it's like Philip running up to the chariot and saying something to, you know, understandest thou what thou lead, readest? At a time, the man just couldn't even understand the Bible. It's impossible to understand the Bible. And somebody said something to me. He restores my soul. Before I talk about elders' responsibility to restore the souls, I want us to talk about the responsibilities we have to restore the souls of elders. I came back from the mission field. I'd been there seven years. I came home for three months and without a break. And I was there seven years. I was 21, 22 years of age when I got there. And now I'm nearly 30. And all I'd been doing was giving of myself. trying to help people live faithful. And I had no idea how much of the spiritual energy they'd taken from me until I came back. I went to the Fried Hardeman Lectures. It did me, uh, but what a lifeblood it is. 5,000 Christians in one auditorium singing and praising God. Do you know how different it is from sitting in that little congregation in Hamilton, Alabama, and there were eight of us, and we sang the best we could, and our singing was so bad that we brought in a brother from the States to teach a singing school, and he told one of the sisters in Christ, he was an elder of the church, cannot believe he did it, he told one of the sisters in Christ, if you, if you really want to help the church, here, sing better. Don't ever sing another word in church. <laughs> do you know? Do you know how true that was? <laughs> you know how that impacted that poor sister. She came in tears to talk to me about it. Isn't that amazing? I appreciate elders. And I came back and I. being an elder inside thank God well which direction do I take them here it is the paths of righteousness he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake you apply that being an elder has nothing at all to do with making my name known, or being a preacher has nothing at all to do with being, being the biggest preacher in the brotherhood. He washed the disciples' feet. He washed Judas' feet. I would have washed Judas' feet. Give me a wire brush. <laughs> And, and, uh, and some, you know, an Ajax, and I will get those feet so clean you won't even be able to see the skin. I could wash it. No, 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 no. 
he washed Judas' feet. And he said to those men whom he's going to say, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. In that sense, they're shepherds. Do you understand what I just did? Their souls are about to be depressed beyond all measure. Peter is going to be so ashamed of what he has done. He could have quit. And in the resurrection, you know what Jesus did? He saw those women and he told those women, you go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee. But that's not all that he said. You go tell my disciples and Peter. Why? Peter's the one who's cursing and swearing, said, I don't even know that man. I'm not fit. In the, there's nothing I'm doing in the kingdom of God. And that's what elders need to do to understand the needs of all the people and to restore their souls. And how many times has the Lord how many times have you gone to sleep and you've tossed and turned to two or three o'clock in the morning and finally you wake up and it's a new day? It happens almost every night. He restores my soul. And that which the Lord does perfectly, he has under shepherds. And he has those of us who are not even elders in any sense as people that we can say to God, use me. Yes. Now, thank you, Robert. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What? I will fear no evil. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm a lamb in a shepherd's flock. In some way I get separated from, from my mommy. I get separated from the flock and I hear the wild beast I'm scared. Darkness is coming. And then I stumble into a ditch and I cannot get out. And about that time, that shepherd comes with that crooked staff and reaches around me and picks me, puts that staff under my body and lifts me up. Because my shepherd And the rod comforts me. There was that wolf. There was a pack of them that came out. And there was that wolf. There was that wolf. There was a whole pack of them coming after me. And all of a sudden, out of the darkness, it was the middle of the night, and my, my shepherd was, you know, I'm, he was sleeping with us out there in the field. And all of a sudden, in the darkness, he takes that rod and he takes that rod and he kills those animals. And so shepherds, there are dangers facing the church. There are more dangers doctrinally facing the church than ever in my lifetime by nearly a hundredfold. Paul said to those elders, take heed to yourself and to all the flock. I know after my departures, grievous wolves will enter in, not sparing the flock. Shepherds, take up that rod. And in the qualification of elders, it says, who's about, about false teachers, talking about the qualifications of elders, whose mouths must be stopped. What does that mean? 
the earliest remembrance I have of my dad doing anything as an elder. I told you last night, he was, West Huntsville did the best they could. They just didn't know any better. They just knew you had to have elders. And so they did. My dad was appointed an elder at age 26. Had no, had no, no, no children even old enough to be Christians. They didn't know any better. They just knew we had to have elders in the church. And the old brother got up and said, I'm retiring. Austin, you're an elder from this day forward. My dad becomes an elder at age 26. I'm one year old. The earliest remembrance I have of my dad ever doing anything as a preacher was, the preacher was up preaching. And man, at West Huntsville, preachers were heroes. Little congregation West Huntsville produced 22 preachers in my generation. 200 members. You're looking at one of them. I thought preachers were gods. I grew up in a family that made preachers great men. That's what I want to be when I grow up. We need to put within a church Elders on a pedestal so young people can see them and what they're doing and thank God for what he's done. And aren't you glad that we have and call every elder by name. And at dinner talk, instead of talking and criticizing, I don't know why the elders decided this, hold up in front of your children the glorious church for which Christ died and give honor to whom honor is due and to praise elders. Earliest remembrance I have, though, is of my dad. And the man's up preaching, and my dad, can you believe this, stands up and says, Brother, what you're teaching is false doctrine. You either change what you're saying, change topics, or you walk out of that pulpit right this minute. I thought my dad had committed the unpardonable sin. Yeah. And when I'm 12, 13 years of age, church divided back in the 50s and 60s. I had a preacher who was trying to lead the church astray. My dad said to a preacher who was my hero, heroes were preachers. My dad said privately to that individual, if you ever mention that, I'll stand up and call you down. I've done it before, and I would not hesitate to do it again. There would not be false preachers in the pulpits of our land if there were not false elderships allowing them to stand there. That's why it's important to have God's elders. Thank God. Grievous Wilson and her among you, and then also of your own self, from within the eldership, there will be those who will arise from within the eldership who's going to lead the church astray. And if you put preachership inside that very part, you'll understand what I'm talking about. What the church needs today. Thy rod comforts me. Yeah. But let me tell you another time that rod meant so much to me. I was a sheep wandering around, wandering astray. I'm not a little baby lamb anymore. I'm full-grown sheep. You know, I'm the, you know, the, he knows his sheep by name. That shepherd knows there's torn ear. He remembers the time when, he, when that beast tore the ear of that sheep. And so he, talk, he calls that little sheep torn sheep. He calls them by name. He's got other good names, but I mean, they, he remembers them in that, in that respect. And so that little lamb has become a sheep. He's tag along sheep. He's wandering off on his own. You know what the shepherd does? Literally. We take that rod and break the leg of that sheep. 
That'll stop you from wandering off. And there are times when elders need to be just as strong to members as they can be and say exactly what Jesus said to them. The fact that if you don't change your life, you're headed in the wrong direction and you are headed for the judgment of God. And that's the rod. You know what the shepherd does? He picks up that little lamb whose leg, or that sheep, whose leg is just broken and nurtures and carries that lamb in his arms back to where the flock was. And nurtures it back to health. There will those arise. What the church is fed is the responsibility of the eldership. Elders need to oversee every aspect, particularly the teachings of the programs of the church, because that's the feed. I, you know it better than I do in many And so he says, in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies, it doesn't make any difference. What's around me, I'm going to feast because my elders feed me. You anoint my head with oil. I don't know if that's medical or not. This may have to do with the fact that you're chosen. The anointing with oil had to do was not Samuel given the responsibility to anoint David and was, was not Aaron anointed when he became a priest? Was not David anointed when he became a prophet? When he became a king? Thou anointest my head with oil. I'm chosen. But it's not just a drop of oil. The cup that the Lord has anointed me with is an overflowing cup. Do I need to sing the words of the songs? Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it'll surprise you what the Lord has done. And elders who are negative toward the church and who cannot see good and see the potential of every member in the church, they're not good at anointing with oil. And our young people, brethren, our generation, my generation is so critical of young people, it's unreal. That generation that's behind me is so critical of, of that next generation. Young people are worthless. Let me tell you, there are some really godly and good young people in the church. I remember the workshop I was here. A young man sitting on the back pew. Asked me his age. I think he said he was 12. He was here at the mission workshop. And I walked up to him and I said, Have you ever thought about being a missionary? I think you'd make a great one. A little 12-year-old boy. I didn't have oil. And I did that because so many people anointed me with oil when I didn't deserve it. Every time they've been on me with all, I didn't deserve it. It's amazing. And shepherds need to have the ability to anoint the sheep with all. And then here's their response. Because I have my elders... Surely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, goodness 
and mercy will follow me. It leads me in paths of righteousness and it follows me. Every day of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What's the house of the Lord? Church of the living God, 1 Timothy 3.15. My shepherd, lead me and I know righteousness because I have seen righteousness in them. Obey them that have the rule over you whose faith literally imitate. Preach a sermon. What if every church were just like me? What kind of church would this church be? Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. And the Bible specifically says you live in front of that church a life that is exemplary. Not that you never make a mistake. Think of what David did when David made the mistake. He acknowledged it, he corrected it, and God forgave him, and God used him the rest of his life. And the elders will make mistakes. And sometimes elders need to come and be restored. Because her life hasn't been the kind of life that leads folks to heaven. Preachers need to be restored. Deacons need to be restored. But not necessarily to come forward and make a restoration, but in their own mind and where they are to do whatever they can. I'm going to stay in the church of Jesus Christ. I know the divine nature of the church. My elders have taught me, and I've tried as a preacher to teach to others. Jesus put a divine institution on this earth, and he calls it his church. It is the church of Christ. And men didn't like the church of Christ. No, it's not church of Christ with a capital C. That's with a little c. It's a church. It's that flock. It's that kingdom. It's that one kingdom. It's that one flock. It's the body of Jesus. And I'm going to start whenever there's there's wayward preachers, but you're not going to get me to leave. Remember the church, you go visit them and you, why why have you left? Well, you know what brother so-and-so did? He got my parking place at church and I just don't think I'm ever going to back to that church again. You're going to hell because somebody got your parking place? That's not what I can say. That's what I feel. I I let let my feelings get above what I should have said. But isn't that that what they do? Some little squabble in the church. Somebody didn't, didn't speak to me. I don't know. He's so stuck up. He's so arrogant. Isn't that amazing? No. I know the church is divine. And I'm in the church until the day that I die. Sometimes church gets mist- church makes mistakes and the elders make a mistake. All of us make mis- mistakes. But when David made a mistake, he corrected it. And so that's what we all do. We straighten it out. If I got your parking place, I'm sorry. I'm going to go to, you know, next Sunday, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stand in that parking place till you get here. I'm not going to let anybody stay in this place. I'm going to stand here. This is your parking place from now on. Instead of, I have as much right to that parking place as you do. I got here early. If you wanted that parking place, you ought to get here in time to get it. They got my seat, you know. You know what to do? That's kindergarten stuff. He broke it in line. 
But isn't that why folks leave the church? A friend of mine was preaching, and he talked to a sister and said, why don't you come? She says, because the windshield wiper on my car is broken. And he said, it didn't rain today. It didn't rain last Sunday. Why don't you come to church? Well, it always might rain. Why don't you come to church? Become an elder and go ask members. John, you can tell stories. You, you can, those of you who are elders can, can tell those stories. They're just, it's just unreal. But I love my elders and I respect them. In fact, I believe the responsibility, and this is Dan's, I believe. I don't have a Bible verse for this. I've sort of got a Bible verse. But I believe one of the responsibility of me as a preacher standing in that pulpit is to build a respect for the eldership and to give honor to them. Paul says to a preacher, to Timothy, against an elder receive not an accusation. Then he's home free. He can live any way he wants to. No, you know the rest of that verse? But you know what the average member of the church does? They hear some little bit of gospel about some leader in the church or some brother in the church or some sister in the church and they make a judgment about them. And they... They hear the gossip as though, it's been, as though it's truth. Even against an elder, receive not an accusation at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Well, the elders are not, they don't have a free ticket, do they? No, because then that sin, preacher man, Timothy, then that sin, you stand up and rebuke them publicly. That's what 1 Timothy 5 says, that the church may learn to fear. Fear the preacher? No. Fear Almighty God. So that as that preacher whose life was publicly known and established at the mouth of two or three witnesses and he's refusing to repent, you rebuke before all that others may learn to fear. You think that little boy who's about six years of age when his dad stands up and tells a preacher you're teaching fast, false doctrine? You either, I think he probably went back the time you could say it, shut up. But you know, you either shut up or get out. You think I'm not conscious of that? You've got to teach what God says. I learned to fear God. When I saw my dad rebuke a hero of mine. And then he says, what about good elders? What about those men who have been elders and have served God faithfully? Elders that rule well shall be counted worthy of double honor. I don't have any hesitancy, John. Thanking you for what you've done for me as a member of another congregation, but oftentimes in and out of part of this work here at Forest Park. Thank you for all you've done for me. And I could talk about other men, and I'm not trying to sing out John and say, look, he's the best elder I've ever known. That's not what I'm talking about. But when elders do right, and I'm going to talk about this some on Sunday, I want this church to know the responsibility it has to elders in the church. Those that rule well shall be counted worthy of double honor. What about those who don't rule well? What does that imply? The elders that rule well shall be counted worthy of double honor. 
What about those who do not rule well? They're just lazy elders. Does it not imply they're still due honor? Isn't that what that says? If this one is due double honor, what about this one who doesn't rule well? He's still worthy of honor. Why? Because he has been chosen in the providence of God and in the teaching of the re revelation of the will of God. That is how he became an elder. Paul said to the elders at Ephesus, Feed the flock of God. Take heed to the flock of God over the which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And a congregation appoints an elder and he becomes in that sense one who is sitting in the position I'm not talking about false elders teaching false doctrine. I'm not under, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just not talking, I'm talking about elders who, who are just sort of indifferent in relationship. They're still due honor. And let me illustrate it. The second year, the end of the first year, begin the second year of the reign of King Saul. He turned against God. It took him one year as king to mess it all up. How bad does it become? Well, he's got this young shepherd boy that becomes a thorn in his side, and he's doing everything he can to, to kill that shepherd boy. He's going every way to do everything that he can to destroy that shepherd boy. In fact, he has to flee. Innocent David has to flee. Talk about walking through the valley of the shadow of death. How about living in the valley of the shadow of death? Because the king has not just sent a posse out to get it. He's brought out his entire army trying to find one man. And David's inside a cave. And that king walks into that cave. Literally, the text says, to use the bathroom. You know what David does? He goes up and cuts a piece of the garment off either that time or the time when he snuck into the camp of his garment. And his soldiers, those men that are faithful to David, are saying to David, kill him! Kill him! He's a bad king. He's an evil king. Kill him! David said, I will not lay a hand against God's anointed. Twice he had a chance to kill him. Both occasions, every counselor David had was saying, kill him, kill him, kill him. And David said, oh no, he's been appointed as God as the king. He's been anointed with oil. He's the king. And even bad elders are worthy of honor. And folks, we don't give it to them. We rob them of a blessing. That's no stopping place. But it is a place we're going to stop. We're going to go eat, have a bite to eat. If you've got some questions after we uh, eat together, uh, we'll come back in here and try to deal with questions that you may have had about things I've said or things you've just wondered about the eldership. And my brother and I can answer every question there is about the eldership. My brother Jerry, big brother, Jerry and I can answer every question there is about an eldership. And any time I don't know the answer, I just ask Jerry. Now we've got one problem with that. Jerry died 12 years ago. 
and they're stuck with dumb Dan. But we'll try to get inside the book, find the Bible answers to Bible questions. Robert, why don't you come and offer thanks for the food and ask God to bless us and bless all that we're trying to do in this workshop.